What's up, family? Thanks so much for joining us for our worship experience. We're so glad that you're part of our community today. Listen, here at Impact Church, we believe one person can impact many. So take a moment, start a watch party, hit like, subscribe, share, help us get the word out. And again, thanks so much for joining us and enjoy the word this morning. But now I'm back in the military full time. This is not my weekend drill. This is not my two week training, but this is full time in the military. And in my head, in my plans that I had for myself, I was supposed to be at this nice, excited station that I was going to be stationed at. It was going to be fun. God's wisdom. Fort Polk, Louisiana. What I found <laughs> helped shape my reality for three to four years. This is where I was going to be stationed. I found myself depressed and lonely because that's not where I had planned to be. I was single, so I was supposed to be traveling the world and given the military this time so I have my college money and get out and go to college in hot Louisiana. I want to be very careful because I don't know who I know around here from Louisiana and what I say, but if you've been in the military, particularly the Army, you know about Fort Polk. So on Sundays, <laughs> I found myself running to a gospel service that I found after service, after service, chapel after chapel. None of it was hitting the spot. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It was not hitting the spot. But I found the gospel chapel. Now, let me help you understand the gospel chapel. That's a combination or a smoges board of all the churches you grew up in in the black community in one service. So, yes, we had the organ. Yes, we had the drums. So I knew I was in a good place. So I found myself there, and in the service, you know, I was so excited to be there because I get to take off my uniform and put on my civilian Sunday clothes. I was able to take off my military cap, slap some Dudley on my Jerry Curl, S Curl that I had, so that I can wear my hair a little bit more because in the military, you can do all that. Yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. But get to church and I will act an absolute fool because I was excited to be in the house of God. And I mean, I would just worship my mind out and just lose myself. It was there during that time that um, hmm, something that began to stick with me and I found myself changing because I learned gratitude. Each week I would go there and I was like, uh, I'm lonely. I made a decision. I don't know why I made this decision, how I'm going to live with this decision. But worship got me to a place where God began to help me recognize gratitude where I was. I began to find friends, friends that I still have today that took me under their wings, friends that, you know, single people knew me as a single soldier, said, uh, come to my house, you know. So I had a, f a hot meal. I had a hot meal every day, but, you know, a good home-cooked meal on the weekends. Leave the barracks, and they're like, ah, oh, you ain't going to church. You're doing something else because you leave on Friday, and you don't come back to Sunday. And that's like, that's none of your business, but Jesus is still Lord. And I had a good home-cooked meal. And so there is where I begin to learn gratitude. I begin to understand the place of knowing that God was with me in my decisions and even in my loneliness. The growth was spiritual, and I matured in the process. I became a transformed Christian because what happened was it was no more about me just getting my Sunday morning fix in, but I began to recognize the need for my walk to be different. I wanted to become a testimony, a walking, living testimony for the Lord. So that's where I begin to change, and I notice a visible change in my life. My question to you today is what happens when your worship gets stuck or you're in a rut in worship? What happens when you're just doing it again another Sunday? What happens when you say, okay, I'm going to try to fix it and not just roll over and turn on the app or turn on my device, but I'm going to get up and get dressed because I want something different from the Lord. But you get here and it's still another Sunday, another few songs, a message, offering, and I'm back home. 
worship in a rut, a worship that is dry. Doing something wrong. Is there something different? Is there something abnormal? Or am I just messed up? Is there this place when you change in your expression of worship where, where you used to be the exuberant one, now you're the more contemplative worship person that you reflect on it and you may cry or you may just lift your arms or are you the person that has to walk it out because now you just begin to think about it and so it becomes something different. But your expression of worship change and things begin to come different. Worship changes for you. We're talking about gratitude, how gratitude is growing from worship to witness. So what happened was after that experience, I came back to Georgia and I was a different person. And when I came back, I actually learned a new phraseology in church. I went through the period where I said, well, maybe I was never saved. I really believed that for a period of time. And then someone had to sit me down and explain to me the lordship of Jesus Christ. I said, the who? Because all I knew was, and y'all come on, say it with me, save, sanct, holy ghost, fire, got a mind, mind for Jesus running for my life. Y'all didn't go to that denomination. Okay, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. We got, a, we got halfway there. And I went through this phase and someone had to explain to me the lordship of Jesus Christ. Then I began to mature more and my gratitude increased because then I understood it was more than just me being saved, but me being a living testimony. What about my life? How do I walk my life that makes somebody else say different? What is it? I can't put my hand on it. It's good. No, I'm feeling it. Like a young man said to me yesterday at a wedding, he was like, walked up to me and he said, um, now mind you, I'm in, I think, a, a shirt and a pair of pants. I hadn't robed up for the wedding. But he said, you're the preacher, aren't you? I said, no, not the preacher of this church. There's another pastor's church. I'm from another city, another state. You know, just, I'm here. And he's like, yeah, it was something about you, man. And so I began to talk to him. But then that's when my walk changed because I, lo I learned to lose my church lingo and talk to people in a way that bring Christ to them. And by the time they finish, I've taught them the word of God, but they didn't even know it was the word of God. So I began to say to him, I said, oh, I, I like that. I say, because I always want my aura. I always want my vibe to be something that's positive. I like when I step to people and I step correctly that they feel there's something positive about me. He said, yeah, I couldn't put my hand on it, but it was something different about you, man. Something in that it's when I say, thank you, Father. My gratitude level is increased because I recognize that our living testimony, a witness for the Lord. So then, it's, I don't want you to get lost, but that lingo began to change because it became a church lingo, witness for my Lord. Soul is a witness. I'm going to make sure that y'all get the links to the churches that I grew up under so y'all know the songs. My soul is a witness for my Lord. Witness. Witness. Soul is a witness. God bless you. So when we hit it, I want y'all to jump on it. All right? Now, I know, and I'm just going to say it on the sidebar, and I know there's some of you online too. I know y'all are some undercover closet people that don't want folks to know what denomination and background you came out. So y'all know the songs. Y'all just don't want to be called out on it. And I pray the Holy Ghost hits you and you have one of those moments. Them quickenings and them fits. <laughs> but what happens is I learned my worship is my witness. Then as that process of my growth happened, I began to understand that worship wasn't just in the four walls, but everything that I do and every place that I go is an active act of worship to the Lord. It just may not be a calling out. It may not be a buck and a shout. It may not be a singing of a song, but how I encounter others, how I walk through my life, how I go through the world is my witness. It began to change me. And so as a result, I had to learn that balance between, yes, I can still be exuberant or however I want to praise God, but at the same time, make sure that becomes something live that I walk out the door with. 
or even when crisis or situations come in life, I don't buckle and I don't fold under the circumstances, but I know how to actively go into a moment of worship like I do here with the organ playing, the drums and the worship team, and I can do it myself at home because he's still a good, good father. It's who he is. No matter what the circumstances, no matter where we are, no matter what's going on, the worship is still there. It's just a matter of how do we actively walk it out. Worship is a witness. So as a result, it began to change me. And it be, as I changed, and this is in my early 20s, my walk began to change. But not just my walk began to change. Then I understood, oh, this is what the scripture talks about. This wise king, this wise ruler, I love him, Solomon, in Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, 14th verse, because he put it in different words, and I understood it. Now, mind you, this is the same scripture where he began to break things down. He had the, still the only king to have the highest amount of money. I don't think there's been one with more property, concubines. Now, that's a whole nother level right there by itself. And wives, all legal. Brothers, you're not supposed to say anything. <laughs> Had everything, but he got all of that never asking for wealth, but asking for wisdom. So when Solomon wrote these words in the third chapter, the 14th verse, he said, first he started off by saying in the first verse, there's a time for everything under the sun. No matter what we experience, there's a time for it. In other words, God had it in his plan. It's appointed. It's the time. But he also gave us the opposite of it. He said, now there's another time for this and another time for this. There's a time for this, but then there's a time for that. You will go through this, but then God would do this. You with me? And then he began to start concluding the matter, and this is what he came up with. I've also concluded that whatever God does, that's the way it's going to be. Now, you could just drop the mic and end it right there because that's a mouthful in itself. Positive or negative, if God is in it and you, our lives are committed to him, God is in it. And if that's what he does, he got a plan. Gratitude taught me to learn to wait patiently for it. Now, can you imagine a 20-year-old learning to wait patiently, sit still? God, uh, ooh. So I made a decision. You're not bailing me out of this one. Three years I, I have to wait. Three years, okay. You don't understand that I'm trying to testify and preach, but mosquitoes that would have a conversation with you before they bite you. Three years, Lord. I was fine. I should have just stayed in the reserves, been back on the block, go my one weekend of a month, you know, two weeks out of the year, and do what I was supposed to be doing. But I was running away from something. And I thought God was going to get me out of it. I didn't know how, but I said, God, you're going to get me out. He taught me. I'm going to finish reading the scripture. Are you ready? Let's pick up. I've also concluded that whatever God does, that's the way it's going to be. Also, no addition <laughs> and no subtraction. Can I stop again? So I was like, okay. In my mind, I was saying, all right, Lord, so... I went and started doing, I worked in the administrative office. It's called the PAC office. So I worked with the colonel. I worked with the lieutenant colonel. I worked with all of them. So everybody that had to do something, I was a personnel administrative clerk. You with me? And so I got to do all of the um, requests and everything. And so I started requesting everything in the world. I started requesting this, um, um, Embassy duty, I started requesting, I even was dumb enough and put in for jump school. Knew I wasn't going to jump, but I was like, get me out of Louisiana, Jesus, please, please. I'll jump out of planes if you get me out of Louisiana. I put in everything. Take it to the lieutenant, the adjutant at that time was a lieutenant, and he was like, really, Cunningham? Yes, sir. And he'll sign it because... He knew, I didn't know that I wasn't going nowhere, but he knew that. And he was just signing for me. And I was just like, all right, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. But with this, the scripture says, it says, God's done it and that's it. That's so that we'll stop asking questions and simply what? 
worship you with holy fear, reverential fear, just recognize, so God, you're in charge. And your being in charge means that I'll have to live with whatever choices I make, but that you got my back. You've covered me in this process, but I got to stay. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've got to stay here in Louisiana for three years. That's a hard one to swallow. But I grew up real quick. How many can say amen to that one? Grew up real quick. I learned quickly that God's way is simply his way. So I began to recognize, wait, wait a minute now. You're worshiping and honoring a sovereign God, one with supreme authority. How can you actually think you can control things or orchestrate things or, y'all ready for it, manipulate things to your advantage? Thank God he's not like us. His ways are not like our ways. His thoughts are not like our thoughts. As high as the heavens are from the earth are his thoughts from our thoughts. And his ways from my ways. So he is not affected like I can affect somebody else with my charm or with my talk. God is like, you going to continue? You know I created you. And I know you. That personality is part of my making. So I know who you are. Fool yourself, son. Won't fool me. I had to learn to honor God's supreme authority. That's his sovereignty. It's absolute authority. No changes, no modifying. It is who he is. You know, and it was that time that I learned these three things about the character of God. That he's almighty. <laughs> All powerful. Yes, he could have gotten me to a nice, cushy, lovely assignment. Like the time when I did come up on orders to go overseas. And I was like, yes. It was the very moment in the very time that I was getting ready to get out of the military. And I was like, oh, you sneaky, you sneaky. I see how you do that. Anybody that's been over to Germany, I had an um, assignment to go to Augsburg, Germany, an MI unit, a military intelligence, yes, military intelligence unit. So I knew then they'd start a preparing and they said, so you're not going to be in those dress greens. That's going to be suited up a little bit more. And I was like, yes, thank you, Jesus. The family had already prepared, and they're like, we'll be there for Christmas. We'll do Christmas in Germany with you. And the president had a whole nother thought, Operation Desert Storm. So I said to them, I said, well, well, okay, okay. So my levy is on hold. Okay, okay, okay. So after this, will it come back up again? And they were like, no. I said, but you said it's on hold. They said, hold, man, it's gone. Just think of it as gone. I said, so can I apply for it again? They were like, you don't apply for it. We were going to sign you there. Now that is off the table. It's gone. Please sign to re-up. Thank God for gratitude and maturity, right? I politely thanked them and concluded my services in the military and didn't re-up again. But it's because I learned my lesson. God didn't get me out of the course, out of the situation I put myself in. But I have to make decisions where I commit myself, my plans to the Lord. My worship is my witness. So then I had to say, no, Lord, what is it that you have planned for me? Where do you want me to go? What door do you feel to open for me, and I'll walk in those doors and not be that 19-year-old that went into the military just to run away from a situation. And so I learned that he was all-powerful. You know, the scripture talks about it in Luke, the first chapter, the 37th verse, it says, nothing is impossible for him. All power is in his hand. I began to learn then that not only is he all-powerful, he's all-knowing. He knows all things. You know, because we talk about it. It was like, the psalmist says in uh, the book of 139, Psalms says, where is it can I go from your presence? And no, it even says this in the fourth verse. Even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you knew it. He knows all things. So before the levy came up, before I decided that I wanted to stay in or get out of the military, the Lord already knew what the plans were for me. I Needed to just yield myself and catch up with his plans. 
and walk in that. We're going to ready? We practice again. Witness. Witness. Soul is a witness. Are you a witness? You got it. My worship is my witness. So after I learned to honor God's supreme authority, I had to say, okay, now that he's not only almighty, all-knowing, he's present everywhere. No matter where I go, he's present. So if I'd have stayed here in Atlanta and dealt with what was in front of me, he was there. Even though I went and did my own thing, and I love it because Minister Darius talked about it, and he's saying, he said, even when I turn my back on you, even when I went and went my own way, you covered and protected me. So when I went and joined the military, don't know what I was doing there, but I did it. He's present with me. That same Psalm, Psalms 139, says, where can I go from your presence? Even if I go to hell, there you're present with me. No matter what situation I'm in, you're present and you're with me. Are we just lip service to the Lord or are we seriously about honoring and worshiping him and letting our worship be a witness to who he is? I learned it then. So that's when things begin to change for me. And so when I came to Georgia and um, my walk was different and I began to walk a lifestyle that says, what am I doing daily to make sure that I reflect who he is and that it brings glory to him? Not just, you know, I don't want to step on anybody's toe, but, you know, not just one of those moments that says, try Jesus, don't try me. You'll catch these hands. Oh, you heard of it before? Yeah. I, I had to learn to live differently. Don't threaten people <laughs> like that. When they step to me, you know, the part 305 will be there where I may smile or I may not smile. That's 305 when I don't smile. But at times, God will make me smile. I'm like, Lord, you know this person does not deserve a smile, right? This is not even a smiling moment. But the word has taught me after I did it in obedience, I learned, oh, it's to kill them with kindness. You know, it's like heaping hot coals upon their head. That instead of me just giving them them hands, I gave them love. I didn't let them walk over me, but I gave them love. Smile. I didn't get smart and say, are you finished? I know, I'm, t I'm all up in it today. But you know, after they finished, I said, and I hear you. Thank you for telling me, expressing where you are, and had a conversation with them. But it taught me to learn to be an altar for the Lord. Let's talk about that. So what changed for me was my experience and my lifestyle. And not only that, I began to live differently. So from there, I learned about letting my life be an altar to the Lord. Daily. You with me? Daily I had to go in public. Clean up the altar. Take Peter Daniel Cunningham Richardson and lay him on the altar. Let him be that sacrifice unto the Lord. And daily I had to Allow the fire of God to burn me so that my sacrifice would be a sweet-smelling Savior to him so that when I walked away, I was a living testimony to the Lord. I couldn't get on social media and send them that meme, try Jesus, don't try me. I could not say to them, who you think you're talking to? You don't know me. I could not walk in there and act a fool. All I had to do is say, Lord, if I die daily to my flesh, Paul talks about it. He says that daily I die to this flesh so that God or Christ may be resurrected inside of me, that I may be a living sacrifice to the Lord. That's what I'm talking about. When you do the full government name, Peter Daniel Cunningham Richardson, that's meaning, God, I'm laying all parts of me. The 30-year-old that changed his name to Richardson. Before that, that was Cunningham, the little Peter. All of that must die, its issues, its concerns, and its baggage that Christ may be resurrected in me. And that while I'm walking, people will get a vibe. People 
will get this feeling from me that it's something different. Nothing special. I'm still a mess. That's why daily, <laughs> they're like, that fool is going back to that altar again. Hey, 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 watch this, watch this. World star, and they take their device, and they film me daily going to the altar, killing myself so that that flesh would die. Christ be resurrected. I learned to build an altar to remember his goodness. See, Joshua, the 22nd chapter, in the 34th verse, I love it because the children of Israel now are in Canaan land. And in Canaan land, they begin to get the promise that was promised to their fathers and forefathers of the land being divided. And so this particular two tribes is on the other side of the end of town, you know, west side or east side, you know, the Bible says. But they, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad, got together and they were in one area. But they build an altar and when it was time for the elders from the other tribes to come and check, they was like, we're about to go to war. These fools have built an altar, and that's not who we are. That's not what we represent. What's going on there? And so as a result, they were like, no, 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 no. The name of this altar is witness. They're like, and? You know, built an altar to the Lord. We have one place. But they had to help them understand, this is for a witness between us. That the Lord is good. They said, look, I know that the temple is in your tribe over there. I know that the house of worship is over there. But I have to be a living witness for who he is. So I'm going to be a, I'm going to build an altar called witness to remind me daily who the Lord is and his goodness to me. That's what they did. You with me? They built this altar to the Lord. And once they sent the priests to come and check it out. And the priest checked out and said, no, no, they're in the right place. They're doing the right thing. This is just a memorial. This is just a, you ready? Testimony of how good God has been. This is so that they can tell their children and their children's children, anybody that come through to know what is that? What's that about? That's what Peter Day daily died on his cross, I mean, died on his altar so that Christ could be resurrected in him. Well, why is he so faithful about everything with the church? It's the church, this, the Lord, that. That's so that daily you understand it's not about him, but it's about the Lord being resurrected in me daily. Something in me must die so that Christ can be resurrected. Both can't coexist in the same place. Both can't coexist in the same place. So as a result, praise team, as you come forward, this is what Tony Evans says. If you limit your worship, if you limit your worship to where you are, the minute you leave that place of worship, you will leave your attitude of worship behind like a crumbled bulletin. So Elder Mitch used to say it every Sunday when she close out. Father, as we leave this place, but never from your presence. You with me? No matter where I'm going, you are there with me. You're all-powerful, you're all-knowing, and you're everywhere. So never from your presence as you stand to your feet with us. This morning I want us to look at, would you commit to the Lord to strengthen or deepen your walk with him? Wherever your walk is, Father, I want it to be deeper. I want it to be a stronger walk with you. I don't know Jesus Christ as Lord, but then would you make a commitment to say that I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ? I want to make a commitment to follow Christ. I want to make a commitment to be a disciple. Hey, you ready? I want to make a commitment to daily die on an altar that Christ would be resurrected in me. And the wonderful thing about it, it's an altar that's public. Others get to see this happen to you all the time. You know, when somebody stepped to me incorrectly and I had to smile and give them that moment, I'm like, you got that, bro. You got it. That's that, you got it. Because Christ got to be resurrected and I got to go home today. But Christ be resurrected me. Father, today, this is our commitment to you, Father. That either we're giving our lives to you for the first time, that we'll be a, the follower of Jesus Christ. 
and we had experienced and walked and learned discipleship to daily die to our ways that your ways would be our walk and our lifestyle. Or, Father, we've already made that commitment, but today I want to strengthen that. I want to go and resurrect my altar that I left abandoned. Father, I want to go and resurrect that altar that I kicked down because I was tired of standing for righteousness. Father, I want to go clean up my altar so that today, a fresh sacrifice, I will give to you. Not just lip service, but my life. A fresh sacrifice unto you.